This is a, a big town with a small town mentality. It's been accused of that on many occasions, but I mean, I, I love this town. I mean, I don't know, it's just a lot of neat variety. bands here. It's just a variety of everything. Every show you go to, it's just, there's always something different. London, London's, London's good, really good. It's a good, good start. City, good city for music, honestly. It's very hard. It's 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 a lot easier to go from working up in London and then going to Toronto yeah. and being able to come back here without having to like you know break ground. There's never really that huge like competitive thing. Everyone is like so supportive and just helping each other get like where they needed to be, which is why I think it's thriving. Mama said, son, go out and clean that yard. Don't be where about that yet Now's the time to live with no regret It was a huge change from Toronto to London in 1969. It was like going out to, to see the Beverly Hillbillies. It was that bad. It was like going to a hick town. But in the London punk scene, it sort of started as a loft party. I wasn't part of that. You had to be in the know. It was the art community, the art and the gay community that sort of helped the punk community along. Like London had a super thriving punk scene here in the 80s. There's always just been that key element of punk. Like, there's always punk bands coming from London. Uh, the punk movement started late December 77 in London, essentially. That's when the Demix formed and played their first gig. It was at a loft party on Dundas Street. Mike Niederman put that on, so that was the first local punk band, December 77. From there, um, they played at the York Hotel, which is now Collie Office. Um, Collie Office has a... Has a a place in my heart. I've seen, I saw negative approach there, which was unbelievable. Collie Office has a bit of a, of a walk in. I think it's because it's like a, it's a long time yeah, a known yeah. bar. Like it's been around for a long time, and people outside the city will be like, oh yeah, I've heard of Collie Office. Uh, and I tried, like it was the Embassy and Collie Office at the same time, and then it was the Salt Lounge, which we had for a while, uh, and Collie Office. And now, I mean, with the Blackshire and everything else, it's always really cool because you have a hub for, for local bands. Yeah, I came from like a hardcore like metal type scene, so it was a little different coming into this because I mean when I started out, you didn't really see too many indie rock shows, so I saw these guys actually, I ended up, I ran into them in Toronto, I knew Phil from the past, so, and it was just fell in love with the band, came back to London and realized indie rock kind of came back, it, uh, it wasn't there when I left, it was definitely a lot of hardcore, a lot of metal, a lot of punk shows, not much else, and it changed and it's pretty sweet now. I mean, you can pretty much, as a band, get a show anywhere as any genre. So, London's grown a lot in the past uh, past five, ten years. My personal attitude about music is how multifaceted the London music scenes are. So, um, it's super open. Like whatever you're into, there's a there's a little home for you. That's, that's something I've noticed with London too. A lot changed recently since I started like going to shows when I was. 14 or 15 is that like the people in the scene around here has opened up and become more accepting. The main thing about the London music scene is that it's so incredibly supportive that everybody in it is like really looking out for each other and I think that's what makes it so different from other like other scenes like everybody here is like really invested in like each other's futures. And, and like uh, all the bands know each other and like yeah. all the promoters know each other too so whenever there's an event everybody comes out it's not just about making personal gains. Mm -hmm. positions. It's like really, really healthy community. Yeah, and even if like say the bands aren't like necessarily in like your genre, like everybody still goes out to support, which is so yeah. cool. Like yeah. 
we had some friends who were in like a, like a metal band who'd always come out to our show oh, yeah. and like sing, and then we'd go out to their shows, and so yeah, it was like really really cool. But yeah, we have like crash. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You just crash, make friends and yeah. yeah, crash wherever, like help each other out. It's always good. But yeah, we have a uh, we have a lot of friends in London, like uh, Kingpin, Laps area. Uh, there's like stuff all over the walls. There's some yeah, bands all like, around. Uh, yeah, like, um, we've we've tried to make friends with just about everybody in a band here. Yeah, there are like a ton of different places in London that like you can play, and a lot of people who are like willing to give you a chance. So London, London in general is like a really good London. I mean, launching pad. People in London, you, like the scene was you, used to be not so nice, but uh, now people actually seem to want to stay around until the end of the shows a lot more and yeah. they're getting compliments too. I find that. Like, yeah, the, people, the, people the, aren't the, afraid to. They're not afraid not to come up to you and like yeah. say how they think your set was, or if like you played like crap that night, they're like, "Oh, well, last time I saw you guys were sick. This time, yeah, it was okay. Like there was some fuck." It's always up, great but, to hear somebody when they come yeah. to you and they say like, "Oh, you were." You guys just keep getting better and better. Like that, mm. I, I like hearing that. Everybody's comfortable with saying like yeah. constructive criticism, so that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. I always like London better because rather than Toronto, who you know they're all so sophisticated and urbanites and everything, they they would just sit and watch. Where you know in London, it was like crazy dance floors and people energy, you know, tons of energy, right? That's just radiating off the floor up into the stage. And whereas in Toronto and that, I mean, there'd be people at shows, but they weren't the, they just didn't have that, that energy that you, that London would have. And bands would always mention that that they always wanted to play in London because of the crowds. It's been a it's been a great place to start a band. I'd say. And yeah. A lot of a lot of like music lovers in this city, which is yeah. there's a really great. solid there's a really solid community, which is kind of like really together. And from there, it's just kind of grown. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of good uh, supporters of the music scene, I think, in London. Uh, a lot of promoters and venue owners and, like, like Colin was saying. We're committed, and like, that's what it takes. Yeah, and even just, like, music fans. And like we were talking earlier, like, it's not uncommon to go to a show and see members of the crowd from, like, all different bands, like, that aren't playing that night. Just, like, people in bands that go out to see other bands play. Sometimes the, the genre is, like, completely different, you know what I mean? But they still go out and check out music, so, uh, yeah, London's pretty, pretty good, I think pretty lucky in that one. Smiled and said I've never felt better I can be taken to ways Like the way we cut ties I'm not trying to make sense I've cut too many That's where some of the bands first got recorded at Fanshawe at MIA. A guy named Tom Lodge was a DJ in the UK when they did uh, the pirate radio broadcasts. And Tom came to London and he started the MIA program. It's easy to say that, like being a graduate of MIA, but I would, I would refer to it as more of a launching pad because there's been a lot of projects that have come out of that that haven't like survived. It's kind of like its own little community, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where you like to network. I mean, I'm, I wasn't in MIA, but I've been around all these guys for a while now, and everyone kind of knows each other and works together, and like you said. Like, everyone just keeps going. Like, it, even if a band only lasts for two years, there's going to be another one. Like, there's going to be a new one, like, right as they go out, like, because of MIA, I would assume. I think it's, like, impossible to even talk about the London music scene without talking about, like, Fanshawe. Yeah. I mean, just being in MIA was kind of inspiring because they were like telling you like go do music so like your homework was to make music you know so, yeah it was like part part of their projects were actually like go meet people in the program and start playing stuff together yeah. so it was like really encouraging like you can go in MIA and, and not really like do anything with it but like a lot of people do too a lot of people do but if you, if you go in with like a really good attitude and like a, a hunger for for making music and, and and doing good stuff, then I think it's great. I mean, that's how like that's how we formed through MIA. Um, so I think that has a really big part. A lot of the bands that are in like the London music scene, they all like kind of form in MIA because people come for the program and then they stay because they like the people like us. Like, I mean, like I graduated last year, but I'm still here because of the band and stuff. 
So people like myself come for the program and then stay for the scene. <laughs> I don't know. Here today is just really close knit, and mm -hmm. it's really easy to learn when you're working with people that are your age. I find, and like that's the best part of MIA. Like you have a huge range of talents and stuff. I mean, like when I came into MIA, I was just playing by myself at the time, like an acoustic guitar. And I started going to all of these rock shows with like bands like the Baxters, like these great bands. And then I was like, I want to be in a band. And then this school assignment, we had to share the land. We had to, uh, like, I got, I got told to make a band, so. You get to jam with, yeah. like, so many different people. It's like, it, it's almost just like a matter of time until you find a couple people that you sort of click with. Like, yeah. you know, you, you, everyone plays on each other's projects. Everyone, you know, jams with each other on weekends or whatever. So you obviously find some people that you get along with and that you maybe share influences with and stuff like that. That's kind of how we started. So. Yeah, and it's like you build you build the friendship around something that you all love, so it's like really good friendships too now that we have. So. And then the MIA guys kind of like took us under their wing, like we were like the I don't know, like the little brothers or something. Yeah, it was awesome. We were like panicking because we had no drummer, and then just a couple of those guys that we know just stepped like, up to the plate. Yeah, yeah they, they were happy to offer and stuff. So. Like, yeah, it was awesome. That's like a really like unique, I don't know, like community thing. Like there were willing to learn our songs and play with us. Yeah, yeah. A uh, big influence of MIA was the guest room. <laughs> uh, it was a student house that our buddies in O Geronimo had, and they made a venue out of the basement. Like, if you're, if you're talking about uh, getting inspired in London, I'd say guest room is huge. Yeah. It's, it's not it's, like they don't do it anymore, but uh, it was a monthly house party with bands, basically, in the basement. Yep. And, it was just awesome. Yeah, they'd book bands from outside MIA, inside MIA, or whatever, and then uh, they cram them all into a basement, like we said, not much bigger than this one, and uh, you just go and play, and uh, you, like like all your friends would be there, like people you hadn't met. It was yeah. perfect. It was like met a lot of people. Yeah, it was it was a great way to meet other people, meet other bands, uh, play with other bands, meet bands that you you sound good with and like build bills in other, yeah. uh, at bars and other places, you know, it's basically a, a party full of musicians. Like my old place was, uh, we used to call it the guest room. It was like a, a venue within London. We played it probably like twice. Yeah, yeah. But like the two, the major difference is alcohol. Like you can't bring your own booze to a bar, but when you're playing a house show, yeah. The liquor's <laughs> running like a stream. Yes. To be honest, like the most people I've ever seen out at a local show um, in the past year, like, have been here. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah, that one we threw uh, at the beginning of last year, beginning of 2014. Yeah. Like, there was like exactly. 250 people here. Yeah, yeah it, it was, was crazy. It was like 100 more. Yeah. 100 more. It was a good amount of people. Yeah. Yeah. I think like London is basically surviving off these house shows right now. If you ever go to one of Nick Reeson's house shows, you just like you see the family. Aspect. The family. That's the family aspect. Like, his family is there. It's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> we've had a lot of success in London, and it's mainly from when we do house shows, we play like in someone's basement, stuff like that, rather than uh, at a venue where you have to pay ten bucks to see like your see bands and stuff, and it sucks having to ask your friends like. Oh hey, want to pay ten bucks to see my band here? Buy a ticket? No, like, no one cares. Fucking, yeah, it's best yeah. when you can just get a hundred people in a shitty small basement like this and you just do your thing. You kind of like you dictate your own rules, like you respect the venue and stuff, like respect the house and. But you can just do whatever, right? Like, and it's great for all ages because kids can just come out, like, bring their own booze, whatever, like, have a good time, and no one's like trying to get them charged for drinking underage and stuff like that. There's several locations in London who have opened themselves up to have local bands play, to have uh, underage shows at these houses, and sort of circumvent these problems imposed by, by bars, prioritizing making a profit over, you know, allowing a creative outlet for the, like, the youth of London. The problem that we have in London is that there aren't a lot of all-ages venues where local bands could just play all-ages. And that's kind of the, the thing that 
worked for London was you get kids going out who are 14 years old who love these bands, they start playing in bands. They keep bringing out their friends and you know they grow up with the scene and the bands. A lot of bars used to, like 10 years ago, used to do a lot of all ages shows. They were really, really popular. And I know that, talking to a couple of promoters now, that they, they don't really do them anymore for two reasons. One, they weren't getting enough kids anymore. The kids really didn't really give a crap anymore. Um, and two, any kids that were coming out were trying to get drunk anyway, so. <laughs> but I mean, I, I always thought it was so, it's such a cool idea because when I, when I, if I had been 15, 16 years old and wanting to see a band, the only way to see a band was to try to sneak into a bar. And I, you know, I didn't have access to anything like that, so I never ever saw anything like that. But, but to be able to go out and see when you're 15, to go see the Forgotten Rebels or go see any, you know, any band that's, you know, from Hamilton or Toronto or something playing Call the Offs, Danko Jones or whatever, whatever the band is, right? And you go see them when you're 15 or 16 years old, that's awesome. Every show that I do, I try to make it all ages because even if there's four kids that are coming out, it's still worthwhile. Um, I don't see a reason not to. It doesn't really cost all that much money. It's just extra work for people who don't want to do that extra work sometimes. But then there's also people who physically can't, or clubs that physically can't, or it's policy. Um, but I try to make every show all ages. Um, I mean, the Blackshire's done a couple here and there, and same as uh, like APK has been doing a lot of all ages stuff now, which is good because what I mean, we don't have all ages venues. I mean, we don't have a 200 to 400 capacity venue that books three nights a week, all local bands. Who, you know, it doesn't cost you anything to rent it out and you can have kids come in. <laughs> yeah. Whereas like, you know, the music hall, if your show's all ages, I mean, with music hall, you still have to pay for venue rental and all that stuff. And sometimes it can, get be, it can be a little bit tricky to make it work. But it affected us, but like when we came to London, we were, we were underage. Like we, we all started school when we were 18. Right. So we could only really play like the music club and Rum Runners. Yeah. We got in some other places. It was kind of sketchy. Like. It was, yeah, it was super sketchy. Uh, one time in Windsor, I got, I had to leave after, right after we played because I was still 18 yeah. so they kicked me up but uh that's a struggle yeah it was it was it was pretty bad on us and like yeah like Dan was saying our like a huge part of our pool is like the all ages people so like whenever we always try to kind of go for the all ages crowd for our EP release we had a we had a house show for it so just so all the underage kids could come and stuff and it was awesome for that yeah. And there's always like huge parties afterwards too, like at the house, because you can't like really party for a long time at bars afterwards because bars, you know, close. Right. But houses don't close unless yeah. unless people kick you out. But <laughs> no, no. But um, also like there's also a lack of equipment when you go to house shows too. It's, it's just like more about the experience than it is really about the uh, technical. You know, you can play in a basement to 50 people a couple of times, and then the first time you kind of go out and do like a real show in London, at like a venue, it's not really like it's your first show ever, right? You've, so it's not not really like you're having band practice, but it's not really like you're playing like a legit like yeah. big bar show. There's some there's some good job, uh, jump off venues though. I'd say like the Roxbury is a fantastic bar for that kind of thing. I mean, Cam and I were talking actually on the way up here, funnily enough, about the Roxbury and how. Uh, I'm pretty sure the first time we ever got paid uh, was a show there, and it's like you get 50 bucks and a pitcher of beer. It was our first show. We yeah. played it at the Roxbury, and we got 50 bucks. <laughs> and up until that point, I'd never been paid for any. No, and we'd never really, shows. Yeah, so I was just like, this is fucking cool. Man. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, we got a whole so... pitcher of beer. Yeah. And then we'd rally. <laughs> that's a good use. But they're yeah. cool there. Like they, they'll take anybody, and and they're still willing to shell out. You know, like honestly, a bar that's willing to pay every band fifty dollars out of their own pocket, just like right from the start. Yeah, it's just not for showing up. Yeah, basically. Yeah, it's not too common. Uh, and they're, like I said, they're easygoing. So like there are certain places in in London where you can at least start out and like be like, oh, I play here, you know, like maybe get some videos together and stuff and show, yeah. show people what you got. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the one good thing about Mike Manuel and Dimitri at the Music Hall is they're the first people to reinvest into the venue, whether it's on other shows or, you know, new production gear, whether sound and lights. I mean, almost every week when I go in there, there's some new toy that they've got that I don't know anything about and it could be like an extra little sensor on a strobe light that does something or, or an EQ. Um, so it helps doing, you know, better the venue and better the product, but also bring in other shows. Absolutely. 
the, the Blackshire pub or the Shire or whatever it's called these days <laughs> is uh, and, and everyone who's involved in, in, in making that everyone who's involved with that bar is is doing great things for the city and and are really um, trying to trying push that yeah I definitely think like well like we said the Blackshire because it's always it's like there's so good to bands there and um, you can always guarantee like a really good crowd there I'd, I'd be happy if I was a band touring it and we and we found a, like something like a black shire in another city where they like take care of you a bit you have a nice place to play people come you know? all around it's a good time yeah um i also think rum runners i think yeah, it's been totally really like really helpful like with all those like it's called like the late show that they do at, like every friday night um and they always have like some some really sweet like local bands and then sometimes like what they'll do is they'll get like a really cool like headliner and then they'll get like local London bands to open up for that like for that really cool headliner which opens up doors for the London band which is really cool. I mean Rum Runners is doing it now with we do this late show series every Friday night which is really cool. Yeah it's uh, three local or you know southern Ontario or, or wherever depending uh, developing bands uh, for five dollars I mean, every band gets paid from the house and uh, cheap drinks, and it's just kind of a, hey, come drink and listen to music and socialize. And it's been really cool so far. Coffee Office is a great place to play. Um, Rum Runners is is awesome. It's an awesome room, and they're they're really good about letting, like, opening it up once a week and letting a bunch of local bands play there and put on a show in such a nice, you know, big room. It's a great place to play. Love's gonna find me. Love's gonna I mean, there was a lot of bands that would even come to London before they would go to the, uh, like a major city like Toronto because London would take a chance on them. They would get booked into the Cedar Lounge or the Blue Boot or Call the Office or even the York Hotel back then. The York, which was Call the, which is Call the Office, right? Um, uh, like it's it's a good road stop for touring bands. That's a good way of putting it. And like we get a lot of opportunities to play with um, sometimes American touring bands and a lot of tour bands like going east and west um, because they're always going to want to play either Windsor, or London, and then they usually choose between Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph, and then go to Toronto. So for that reason. Um, <coughs> Geographically, I guess it's a good spot to play. And like we have a lot of different venues that cater to a lot of different genres, so it doesn't matter which kind of touring band you are, there's there's kind of there's gonna be an opportunity for you to play. This like the geography of it and like how you, you're pretty close. Like you can drive an hour and you're in you know, I don't know, Guelph or Waterloo, Kitchener, like all these different places. Like it makes touring when you're starting off just you can do like a week on the four oh one and you know, play a different city to completely different people, different promoters, every, every single night. Whereas, you know, if, if you go somewhere else in Canada, you might have to drive nine hours just to just to get to the next city, right? So that's that geography, I think, is like huge. So many incredible bands coming out from this area who are now starting to tour. I mean, like Ivory Hours, Texas King, Big Lonely, Old City, who are technically Toronto, I guess now, but still London. Um, and then, you know, there's a, a bunch of metal bands and metalcore bands and folk and and they're all touring and they're all doing something and people are starting to pay attention. Like it's like continuously humbling I find to be like in the presence of like some really talented people that are really like doing different stuff. Like so we were all immersed in this tiny like community right where everybody supports everybody if you play a show, almost all your MIA family come out to check it out, you know, like everybody's supporting each other and stuff, which is an unreal thing for a band to have at the beginning of what they're trying to do because a lot of bands don't get that at all. It's like the only people who come out to their shows are like their closest friends and their parents, right? And, yeah. and that's, it, you know, it's great, but it, it doesn't make you want to like keep pushing. Like yeah. in some ways, maybe I could be wrong. Like like that's just in my in my opinion. It's like it helped to have a bunch of people our age just automatically come out and want to see what we're doing. Yeah, we went from having like a lot, like very few people to at our shows, and like now like we're blown away when we play here at home. 
I'd like sometimes I'm, I, the people who come out, it's great. So tons of cool people. Two years, yeah, it's like the, the greatest, the greatest home, home city. It's just I don't know. It's it's gotten a lot more accepting. There's a lot like I different bring, people out. I bring my the, I bring my mother out to show sometimes, yeah. and she's like 55, and uh, recently like brought her out to a few shows, and people have been like really accepting. People like won't judge her for being a 50 year old woman like at a show. It's definitely more community feel. Yeah. Feel at home. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a out of town. Yeah. Out of town bands usually feel at home when they come here. I feel at least. Uh, yeah, I've heard that quite a bit. Like, like, every time we play the APK, you can't turn the corner without seeing a friendly face. It's just mm -hmm. yeah, it's nice. Brandon Edie is filling the London Music Hall with all sorts of stuff on a regular basis. So like, it's never boring. Yeah. London's a good city for that. I think there's always something cool coming through at some point. I think that like. Through, through my experience, and I've, I've only been a part of the London music scene for a couple of years. I think that like, and it's pretty cliche, but the only thing constant is change. And like, even in just the past couple of years, it's been like, this is the hot spot, and that is the hot spot, and this is the place to play. And no, that is, and it changes like, all the time. So I think like, it's hard, not only is it hard to predict the future, I think that like, it's just, as of right now, it's just constantly ever-changing. And maybe that's the way London's supposed to be.